Hello, good morning all. Let me invite the man of the moment, the chief guest of this second edition of India Digital Empowerment Meet and Awards. He actually doesn't need any introduction. Dr. Arisham is a name itself. You talk about Aadhaar, you talked about the e-governance journey in the country, you talked about COVID, and uh, many other things. Whatever transformation has happened in terms of e-governance in India, he's the man who has seen it all, who has done it all, and is still doing. A huge round of applause for Dr. Arish Sharma, <laughs> Chief Executive Officer, National Health Authority, Minister of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. And it was, it was my honor seeing him very closely in Jharkhand when he was the Chief Secretary of Jharkhand, how he brought transformation in terms of PDS, if I don't, uh, if, if I remember correctly, by using other uh, six, seven years back. A big round of applause for Dr. Arish Sharma, Chief Guest of IDM. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, and good morning to all of you, my friends on the dais. It's an honor for me to be here, and I'm thankful to the organizers for inviting me to this Apex Second Digital Summit, Digital Governance Summit. Uh, today I want to share with you a little bit of India's digital governance journey and, and how it has kind of come of age in some sense. Uh, you know, we were, uh, th there was a time when we, there was no concept of internet in our country, not in our country at least. And uh, uh, there was no, you know, email also in those, those times. Uh, then those were the times where you had standalone systems, uh, initially Unix, and then of course came the disk operating systems, DOS, which is non-graphical, kind of just, you know, uh, you used to see C colon greater than kind of symbol. So this was a time when the district magistrates uh, in those times, they were doing a little bit of experiments of using technology to simplify some parts of governance. So we started, uh, some of us started in, you know, simple systems like treasury. Now treasury accounts used to take three months, four months to send to the accountant general and you know, there were all kinds of uh, issues involved. We thought that treasury will be a very simple thing to start because it's all rule-based. It is all, you know, simple yes and no, and you pass the bills and you send the advice to the bank and bank pays the money. So we started with treasury. Then we started with some other small, small experiments and, you know, uh, different district magistrates started using these systems in a very small manner. And soon, everybody realized that, look, whatever things we were doing in a manual manner, it's better if we do them using this tool, because this tool has the great power to essentially, you know, crunch the data, uh, you know, fast processing it can do. Of course, in those times, you did not have the concept of a hard disk. You just even did not have a concept of an operating system, so to say, there was something called uh, if I remember CPM, Control Program Monitor, and we used to have a big disk which we used to kind of insert. This has the operating system, so-called operating system, and the data and other things. So slowly and slowly, this you know, concept emerged. People computerized public grievances, land records, some kind of ceiling cases monitoring, NREG in those times used to be the, you know, the employment guarantee scheme, and we, uh, many of us did that. So some of us in the bureaucracy, we developed an interest in this area where we thought that how technology can be leveraged to simplify governance, to quick delivery of services, for quick delivery of services, and many other, you know, especially the monitoring of information systems, managing information systems, whereby we used to monitor the progress of various development programs in the districts and other things. This is what we actually uh, started doing. And then uh, slowly and slowly this whole concept developed and you know, we had a department of IT in uh, various state governments slowly. We had department of IT in the government of India also. Uh, initially it was focusing on electronics, but then soon it became the department of electronics and information technology. And they started in the, if I remember, 90s, a program called uh, 
SWAN, State Wide Area Network. They started the program, this NEGP, National E-Governance Plan, I think in 1995 or something like that. Not very sure about the timings, but maybe 2000 or something. So they started that program, and that program envisaged creation of a state wide area network, creation of the state data center, and then a number of programs which actually came up. And, and then, therefore, this governance, digital governance, or e governance, it was called. E was the, you know, anything which is digital was prefixed at E, small e. And we always used to say that the E is small, but the G is large, G is capital, which is governance. So don't think e-governance is less of E and more about governance. It's about governance. It's the content which matters. E is only a methodology or a method which actually can do this governance stuff. So the e-governance was the prachilit word, as you say, in those times. And, and we all started doing the statewide area network and the policy of right of way of the fiber laying. The fiber laying also started. And then we came up with something called mission mode projects. A number of mission mode projects were done. And, and that was the period from, let's say, early 2000 to 2007, 8, or 9. Those, those were the times. And a lot of stuff happened. A lot of the projects which were started at the district level by some of the officers. I remember one uh, officer, Amod, who had uh, started some uh, project in Sitapur district, which is basically you know, relating to public grievance or something. And then that became the, the basic national project. So all these projects which were being done at the state level or even district level, they were sort of catapulted into a national level program because everybody thought that these are common things. Good thing about our country is that while we have a federal structure, we have multiple states, more or less the same systems of governance are everywhere, whether it is registration or whether it is you know public distribution system or Narega or many other programs, except probably land revenue. Land revenue systems are a little bit different uh, you know, depending on whether it's a permanent settlement area of Bengal, Bihar, and Odisha, or whether it is, uh, you know, Bombay Presidency or Madras Presidency or Avadh. That's the basic difference of Rayatwadi systems or permanent settlement, Jamidari. All those are different. But broadly, the maintenance of land records also follow the same pattern. So one of the good things about our country is that when we develop a system, whether we develop a PDS system or a treasury system, or any other system, it actually is replicable around the country. So that way, I think we are in a very, very comfortable position. So that was, those were the times when we did a lot of governance, and this was a very important. We used to have a lot of e-governance conferences, and there were awards, national e-governance awards, which were being given. So all that, that happened. I mean, I don't know whether it's of interest to you or not, but I thought I'll just, uh, you know, tell you because, as he said, I have seen it all. Yes, I have. Now this is 45th year of my uh, journey in the government. So, so I, I think I have some kind of experience of looking at these, these projects. So uh, uh, then, <laughs> then the first project, which was a nationwide project, the rollout was nationwide. That was an extremely ambitious project which we started way back in 2009. This project was the unique identity project. And this project basically was born out of the you know, problems which we were, we were facing in this country, the problems of duplicates and ghosts in beneficiary databases. Because along the time, you know, when we started from the community development project in the first plan, second plan period, CD blocks as we used to call them, they became, you know, slowly and slowly people realized that this community development may not be the best model of development. It's better that we, you know, kind of provide individuals the help which they need. So it all became individual oriented kind of programs. And, and that is where, you know, we started giving subsidy, we started giving food, ration, and other kinds of things. And we soon realized that people were gaming these systems. Gaming these systems by creating multiple identities, gaming these systems by including dead people, imaginary people, fake people into the systems and deriving benefits out of that. So the 
fake and ghost, ghost and, and duplicate became a very large problem. And for that, you know, there was a project called the BPL identification project, which is how do you assign a unique identity to the BPL families? That is started in 2006. And then there was a committee constituted under uh, the then External Affairs Minister, Sri Pranam Mukherjee. This committee went into the question as to how we can assign unique identity to the BPL families. And soon it turned out that family may not be a good idea. Why, how can you do that if you assign unique identity to it individual, then automatically family is nothing but a collection of individuals. So then they you know, go, went on to the question as to how we can create unique identity for individuals. And then we, the, the committee appointed a consultant, Wipro was a consultant who was appointed, and that consultant, you know, they started thinking whether the existing databases, which is the BPDS database, the BPL database, the Narega database, and other databases which are existing in our country, whether we can, you know, mix and match and merge and create some kind of database which is super database of all individuals. And they did a lot of uh, experiments, and I, I believe there were 26 volumes of you know, reports. As you know, consultants produced large number of reports, because that's what they get the money for. So they, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not being critical of consultants. I'm just uh, sort of uh, saying it in a very light vein. So they produced report, and they came to the conclusion that it is not possible. If you have a demographic kind of you know, matching and mixing, it, you can't produce, because in one database, my name will be Ram Sevak Sharma, another will be R Sharma, another will be Ram Sevak. It's not possible to see whether these three fellows are the same, one and the same fellow. So it became a problem. And of course, my father's name will be also addressed differently. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to create that. So then the committee basically ended up, you know, in 2008, December, they ended up saying that let us create a unique identity authority of India. And that identity authority must do this job of creating the unique uh, you know, kind of identity for each citizen or each resident, they did not say citizen. So that is how this UID Authority of India was born. And the unique identity authority of India, I was not very sure whether the identity was to be unique or the authority was unique. You know, this, this word, <laughs> this adjective of unique was on the authority or the identity. So there, you know, we started, and this was the first project, which was a nationwide project, which actually, you know, digital project or technology project, which is a nationwide project. And it was a project which had never been done before. No country in the world had adopted or actually had, had uh, attempted this kind of project. And we soon realized that it's really a moonshot. Nobody has gone there before, and we don't know whether we'll succeed or not. So therefore, you know, we deliberated and, you know, I had the good fortune of being the director general and mission director of that. Uh, Mr. Nandan Lekani was the chairman and we assembled a team of, you know, public, private, all kinds of officers from every service. And then, you know, many, many consultants and many bright uh, individuals. We started doing it. And once we realized that uniqueness is a very tough problem, especially in a space of 1.3 billion people, then we said, nothing but technology will have to undergird this project. And ultimately, how do you decide? Demography does not work, so therefore the biometrics is the only thing which is now available to us. So we went in to decide on the biometrics, which is the, which is the fingerprint and the face and the iris. And that actually gave us the confidence that we can have a very high accuracy, even in a number as large as 1.3 billion. So this became the project, and you know, when we said Aadhaar is a number, not a card, everybody started laughing, uh, and we said, no, it's a next generation digital identity, because Aadhaar is not going to be another card. It has to be an identity which can be plugged into any kind of transaction. And we will just have the minimal, you know, information collection, which is name, gender, and age, that's all, and of course, communication address to send the letter, but it will be a digital identity living on the cloud. So people said, no, it, it will violate privacy, it will profile citizens, it will do all kinds of bad things to the people, government will have all the power, and all kinds of things happened. You are aware of that. Aadhaar became a secret number, which is so unfortunate. 
and, and then, you know, all this thing started. And it, it was sad to see that something as transformational and as Aadhaar, and as basically it was the first project which was IT project or the where biometrics were used, being used for a development agenda, not for a forensic agenda, not for a crime control agenda. So that is what it started. I will not you know, describe the basic features, but suffice to say that Aadhaar was only a random number. No profiling is possible. Number does not tell you anything. On a number line, it had a density of 1%, which is basically 12 digits. 11 digits are real digits. And you can create 10 to the power 11, which is 100 billion numbers. And we are just 1.3 billion. So, and it was all randomly distributed on the number line. So it is random. <coughs> it also ensured that it is interoperable. It is based on open API. It's based on open standards and multiple things. And of course, we then created an ecosystem for enrollment of Aadhaar, which was incentive aligned. So the state governments were given money that, all right, I'll give you 50 rupees, you give me one Aadhaar number. They in turn allotted the, uh, appointed the enrollment agencies, then all that happened. And, and actually, it, it is a project which actually becomes the Aadhaar, in some sense, of every, more or less every digital transaction. So I must tell you that there is no country in the world except probably Estonia, which is 1.3 million, and we are 1.3 billion. It is no comparison. So except one or two countries, every country has got identity, let me tell you. Uh, Europe, every country has got those as soon as they are born. Sweden, our friend is here. He knows that their, their identity number, and actually their identity number has a lot of, lot of information. It contains the date of birth also, if I'm not wrong. Are you sure? Isn't it? So it does contain this date of birth. So we don't have any of these things. So fortunately, the privacy that Muttu Swami case happened, and the Supreme Court, even after eight years, decided, first of all, that our privacy is a fundamental right. And secondly, Aadhaar does not violate privacy. Aadhaar does not create a surveillance structure. Aadhaar does not profile citizens. Thank you very much. So all that happened. This was, we got confidence, honestly. We got confidence that we can do something of a national scale, of a societal scale. And then, of course, Aadhaar has started being used. I must tell you that the current usage of Aadhaar is just about 10% of its potential. Just about 10%. Unfortunately, Aadhaar has become only a Sarkari project being used for Sarkari things for government things. After all, government has made a road, which is unlimited lane road. Why should only government vehicles run on that road? Why can't private vehicles also run on that road? Therefore, I think there is a need, and, and nothing prevents, not even a Supreme Court judgment or anything. It does not I think we need to explore more. And, because look, every system you interact with, even when you come here, the first question is asked, who are you? What is your, you know, entry into any system, digital, physical, any formal system requires you to prove your identity. So identity is really fundamental and basic for your entry into any system, any subscription. And that includes private as also public. So I think we need to take it forward more. And I'm sure our, our prime minister is absolutely focused on the this whole issue. I have never seen a person more, you know, more understanding of technology and its application at the ground level than our prime minister. So I'm sure this, this has started happening. And of course, came 2014, then we had Digital India program. And Digital India program had very clearly defined deliverables, areas. It, it, it actually sought to make India into a digitally empowered, empowered society and knowledge economy. And it focused on the digital connectivity, it focused on the software and services, and it focused on the citizens' empowerment. And from there, I think Aadhaar also got a new lease of life. This actually was where you know, the prime minister got absolutely focused that we need to use these digital art artifacts. And from there, in 2016, you know, Aadhaar 2014, then Digital India program, and then, of course, we focused on connectivity. So look at connectivity, what's happening today. 
When, you know, 2014, let's make that as a comparison point. At that time, you had a limited number of, you know, two, 4G was not there, 2G was there, largely 2G, which has no data capability. 3G was half data capability. Initially, we started uh, mobile in 2000, where the per minute rate was 8 rupees 40 paisa, and the person who was being called also had to pay. And therefore, we developed that missed call, you know, for kind of economics in this country where I would give a three missed call and then you will understand what that means. If I give you two, what that means is so people were passing messages like Morse code, you know, missed calls were the method. And from that point onwards, uh, you know, we had for many years, we had those 300 rupees per gigabyte was the rate of telecom. And today, what is the rate? Seven rupees per gigabyte. Indians are using 17 gigabyte per month per user. This is the highest in the world. The rates are the lowest in the world. Ask my friend from Sweden, what is the per gigabyte rate? Maybe, maybe, uh, you know, this will be about seven or eight kroner if I'm not wrong. Maybe more. And here we have just about seven rupees. This is, in America it is 12, 12.34 dollars per gigabyte. 12.34 dollars. That's what I looked up some time back. This is seven rupees. So, and we had 1.2 billion mobile connections. We have 800 million internet connections. We have 600 million smartphones. 4G everywhere. 5G is now coming. So, therefore, there's an abundance of connectivity data. There are only a few thousand villages in remote rural areas which are not connected, everybody is connected. So digital connectivity is a problem which has been solved. So therefore, now that online digital artifact called Aadhaar, it is now a reality. It's, people are, we have done 71 billion authentication in the last eight, nine years. 71 billion in 7,100 crore. This is the, so everybody on an average has done about 60 times, you know, authentication. Whether, and now Aadhaar has come up with a face authentication the easiest one where you don't need any device, any, you know, fingerprint device or an iris device. Then came in UPI. Again, we said, look, let us unbundle the, the banking system from the payment system. How can we do that? Banks are repository of the money. They also do the transactions. But how can we take out the transaction part and do the payment separately? So we came up with a unified payment interface, which is actually nothing but a set of protocols. And we said, look, anybody who actually follows this protocol will be able to do business. And today you have six billion transactions per month happening on UPI. It is the only system in the whole world which is instantaneous. It is absolutely free for the customer. You know, you transfer money from Western Union Bank or something, you charge 2%, 3%, whatever percentage, come on. If I transfer one rupee to you, to Manu or anybody, he will get one rupee, not even 99 paisa. So this is another part. So another issue which is important, frugality. You see, when the rate of mobile was 8 rupees 40 paisa, very few people were calling. Today, the calling, as I said, 21 gigabyte per, 17 gigabytes per month per user. Everybody is calling 600 minutes is the average calling time per person per month. Average. Some people may not even call. Some people are calling hundred, you know, hours and hours together. Call is free. So this is the this is the transformation which happens. India is a country of low value, high volumes. And only when you actually create this low value thing, then and only then things accelerate. Imagine people were not able to open bank accounts of the persons and we, we as collectors, you know, commissioners, we were always grappling, why don't you open bank account? Khata kyo nahi kholte bhai? Log kehte the khata khulwane koji aata hi nahi. Bank wale is liye interested nahi the because agar khata kholne mein 100 rupiah lagega aur ye bandha 50 rupiah jama karega ke well, what is the, well, mein to, mujhe to ghaata hi ho jayega. I will not be able to recover even the khata kholne wala money. So therefore, nobody was, you know, doing this, this financial inclusion, as we call it. But came Aadhaar, Janathan, Aadhaar and Mobile, Jam Trinity, 
2014-15 economic survey, they basically opened up the whole thing and we opened 400 million accounts in as many days. So this is the power where you make frugal, low cost, easy accessibility into the system. The cost of opening a bank account became two rupees from 500 rupees. Two rupees. That's how it happened. So this is, we realize that unless you have systems which are frugal, which are scalable, which are speedy, things will not work in this country. And we learned those things from Aadhaar and UPI. Then came, you know, the third which I want to describe because I was associated with that also is COVID. Now COVID again is, is essentially a system which, which is started and now it is 200 billion plus, 2 billion plus in a matter of about a year or a year and a half. Now that, that also we realized that unless we do interoperable systems, interoperability is also very important. Interoperability is a part of UPI. Everything should talk to everything. That's how Coven was built. Coven had published open APIs. Now there are 100 plus partners of Coven, Paytm, Infosys, Apollo Hospitals, Make My Trip, everybody. They are basically providing the services to their clients or to their holders, whosoever has got that application for booking the appointment, for actually uh, you know, uh, doing the uh, vaccination, delivering certificates and all that. So this is another societal system which we created, a society scale system. In COVID, in one second, we were doing 3,000 vaccinations. 3,000 vaccinations per second. The day we did 2.5 crore vaccinations per day, the peak was 3,000. So that also, again, has to be a scalable system. India is not, you know, all Europe combined together will also not have that population which India has got. It has multilingual. Again, it has to be inclusive. The software has to be inclusive, multilingual, interoperable. These are, again, you know, values of the, you know, basically, characteristics of our software. So this is what happened. Now there are, once we have learned these, once we have built these pieces, artifacts, you know, on Aadhaar, we made electronic KYC, authentication, e-sign, digital locker, these were all the artifacts built on top of Aadhaar. Similarly, UPI created a wonderful payment system. Coven created an interoperable system. So now we feel that these digital artifacts can be, you know, these building blocks can be used to create wonderful solutions. One of the, one of the another architectural principle is don't make vertically integrated solutions, just make components. Use these components like a Lego blocks to create structures. And then finally, now we are using these structures and these building blocks into various kinds of systems. ONDC, you must have heard of is Open Network for Digital Commerce. We are using that, the same principle. Same principles we are using in Aishman Bharat Digital Mission now, which essentially is, you know, will, will add all kinds of systems to deliver health services using information technology in a very, very efficient manner. And this is, this is, these are the broad architectural principles. I think I have taken too much of time. Yeah, so I, I, I think I'll stop here broadly. But what I want to say is that India has truly leapfrogged. And believe me, I'm not saying out of jingoism or out of, you know, pride, etc. for my country. No. I'm saying it in a very objective manner. Because I've also had the good fortune of interacting with various other countries, how they are on the digital journey. And I think we have truly leapfrogged. And we have leapfrogged because of the basic architectural principles which we designed. We designed, there should be no monopoly, there should be interoperability, there should be scalability, there should be open standards, open APIs, frugality, all those characteristics must be designed into the systems. And once that happens, and then of course unbundling, then it will work. Our prime minister's dream of making India into a digital emp digitally empowered society and knowledge economy is definitely coming true. And he is not stopping at any place. He's basically saying, now let's use it for digital various domains. Let's use it for health. Let us use it for agriculture. Let's use it for ep education. All these society level domains, digital commerce, we must use. 
Today we have a true examples of a presenceless, cashless, and paperless governance. These three things are absolutely achievable. What we need to do is to basically promote more and more technologies, empower more and more citizens, and, and ensure that everybody is included in the system. So the inclusion, the adoption, the empowerment, these are the things which we need to really take it forward. Thank you very much, friends. How do you define the technological and innovation advancement of a country? As Sir has said that uh, through solutions which are scalable, interoperable, and also end of the day which can benefit the people and the nation as a whole. And that has been the uh, mantra of last 20 years of e-governance journey in India. And who better than Adish Sharma can talk about that? And truly, we're honored to have you with us, sir. As you have said, that Honorable Prime Minister has a vision that we should empower people and the nation through technology innovation. Luckily, the, the theme of this event is also see empowering people and nation through digital innovation. And that's why the best of the minds have come together to discuss and deliberate upon uh, various aspects of technology innovation which can be leveraged for governance so that some change can happen on ground. Thank you so much. A big round of applause for Dr. Arish Sharma as well. It's our honor to felicitate Dr. Arish Sharma with the Digital Governance Leadership Award. And I request Gopi also to come on stage.